Thank you so much, brother. Appreciate that. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good, morning, Good to have you guys here in the house of the Lord this morning. If you have your copy of God's Word, I encourage you to take it out. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 1 this morning. We'll be looking at uh, several passages of Scripture in Genesis. We'll actually be looking in Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3 this morning. Um, but uh, while you're turning there, let me just uh, take a moment and read uh, just a thank you note um, from a couple of our ladies that... Uh, have helped put on uh, our Friday night worship service. If you did not have a chance to uh, see on Friday night and be here for uh, the worship event that we hosted for the Jubilees, it was uh, just a tremendous night of worship. Jean Marie and Laquita did a great job organizing and planning that. They not only are a part of the Jubilees, but they helped promote that and uh, put it on here for our church. And they asked me to read this thank you and uh, this recognition to you all this morning. They, they write, Laquita and I would like to acknowledge the 80 plus volunteers that came together to perfectly execute all that was needed to welcome our Jubal Heirs guests who came from all over Georgia to lead us in our wonderful worship service Friday night. We are humbled and overwhelmed by the amount of sacrificial support and enthusiasm shown, be it through serving on one of the 18 teams, baking cookies, coming to help set up or clean up or providing administrative support. It took us all and we are all grateful uh, to know that the love of Jesus was shown to our Jubal heirs, their guests, and those attending the worship concert by our volunteers. We believe approximately 650 guests were in attendance. We know that the gospel was proclaimed both through song and word. And we know his word does not return void. And lives were impacted by the gospel message. And we are truly grateful to God be the glory. So to all of you that helped make that a reality, thank you so much for uh, just volunteering. Yeah, give yourselves a round of applause. And <laughs> tremendous opportunity for us to just uh, worship uh, together and, and to, uh, to gather in one place at one time for a night of worship. It was truly great. Uh, let me just go ahead and say this as well. I want to encourage you. You don't want to miss next Sunday. Next Sunday morning, we're going to have Mission India with us here. And uh, they're going to be with us. If you don't remember, a few years ago, we began a partnership uh, with Mission India. Um, they are doing ministry in India, and we are partnering with them. Um, they are doing great work there. India is a closed country when it comes to the gospel. There's tremendous persecution that is done there. Um, and, uh, and so we partner with them to help get the gospel to the people of India. And uh, so you don't want to miss it. They'll be here next Sunday morning. They'll be in each of our morning services. And it should be just a tremendous time for us to, uh, to be encouraged by them and for us to encourage them um, as we gather together. It's hard to believe we're really close to hosting. Uh, the first week in April, we'll be hosting a mission team from uh, Kentucky. Uh, they'll be here, I believe, April 1st through the 6th. And so I uh, just want to advise you, advise you of that. They'll be with us. And then, uh, and more importantly, and I just want to encourage you with this, uh, this is an announcement for all of our families, especially those with young kiddos. Um, we are going to be doing something special to help you as young families teach the story of Easter to your uh, children. And so we're going to be hosting a 12-day scavenger hunt here in our city and in our community. And uh, what we're going to be doing is each day we're going to be hiding a, an egg in our city somewhere. And we're going to drop a clue on social media to tell you uh, where that egg is and uh, how you can be one of the first ones to get there. And uh, what we want you to do is find the egg with your children, with your family, come take a picture, post it on social media, and uh, we'll give away prizes each day. And with each day that you're doing that, we're going to tell progressively the story of Easter and uh, help you have a way to tell the story uh, for your family to teach your kids the story of Easter. And so we want to invite our community by this, but we also want to help you tell the story of Easter with this. And so we'll give you some more details um, uh, as we get closer, but uh, I think that will be what uh, um, March 19th through the 30th will technically be the dates of that. And so uh, the first person to be there to find the egg will get a prize. The first three uh, families that are there will get a prize. And then every family that comes each day will be registered to win a prize for that day. So um, you can win prizes every day leading up to Easter. And so it should be a, just a fun way for us um, to uh, invite our community and help tell the Easter story. So lots of good stuff coming up in light of everything going on here uh, in our church ministry. And so I want to encourage you guys to be aware of that. All right. All right. All the announcements are out of the way. Uh, let's dig into God's Word this morning. If you have your copy of God's Word, turn to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to begin reading in, uh, in verse 24. So would you stand in honor of the reading of God's word? And uh, let's uh, read together, okay? 
Genesis chapter 1, verse 24, it says, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind. Okay, you need to remember that phrase there. You need to underline it. After their kind. Cattle, creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. God made the beast of the earth after their kind, the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it. Let's just pause right there. As we begin to dig into Genesis chapter 1 today, church, I want you to know, I want to do my best to challenge you and to talk to you about what it means to be human. What does it mean to be human? We're going to dig into that because what we're going to discover is that it is very significant for us to understand how we, how we were created, why we were, we were created, and how does God connect to humanity. And so this morning, I want us to dig into that. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, I pray that over the next few moments, you would help us to dig into what it means to be human. I pray that as we do that, God, I pray that, that you will be gracious to us and merciful to us. Because, Father, you're going to cause us to dig into the human problem that we have of sin. And, Father, I pray that by your grace, you would, through your love and through your truth, expose that sin to us. But God, I pray that your mercy would meet us there. I pray that your forgiveness would be poured out upon us and that, Father, as you shine the light of the gospel on the sin in every one of our lives, that, God, we wouldn't run from you. But, Father God, we would be quick to confess our sin. And, Father, we would find you loving and merciful in these days. And so, Father God, speak to every one of us. I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. So this morning, I want to dig into what it means to be human. And everything that we're going to study in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3 are going to help us understand this simple fact. The fact that humanity has a distinct and divine creation, a distinct and divine purpose, and a distinct and divine problem. Okay, so as we dig into humanity today, we are going to see in Genesis chapter 1, in the verses we just read, that humanity has a distinct creation, okay? It begins in verse 24 with the phrase, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind. That is a very specific and significant statement, and it is made here in reference to cattle and beasts of the field and creepy things. Now, I just want you to know, I don't know what all of the creepy things are. I just know that when it comes to alligator, snakes, and spiders, they creep me out, okay? And they are kinds of things that I have no desire to be around, okay? And so as we begin to dig into this, what we're going to see is that the animals are made after their kind. God has distinctively created animals according to their kind. Now, here what we see in these verses is that cattle are made of their kind, beasts of the field are made after their kind, and creepy things after their kind. The same thing is said in verse 21 regarding sea creatures and birds. That sea creatures are made after their kind, birds are made after their kind, and if we were to go back to verses 11 and 12, we would see that plants also are made after their kind. So it doesn't matter whether it's day three or day five or day six, God supernaturally was making each of these animals after their own kind. He was not uh, creating them um, from each kind, developing one and then from that one another and from that one another as if they're all links in the same chain. What God did was when he created everything, he made them specific according to their kind. And we need to see that distinctiveness. What we also need to see is, this, is the distinctiveness for humanity because look at what he says in verse 26. After God made all of these beasts and cattle and creepy things after their kind, it says in verse 26, then God said, let us make man 
in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the rest of what he had created. This is significant because here, once again, God is making a specific, distinct statement regarding humanity. Humanity is made in the image and likeness of God. Humanity has a distinct and divine creation. And we need to know that today. We need to know that because here the word translated image means image or resemblance. It's used in the Old Testament in reference to idols, actually. The word specifically means shadow. So God is creating man and woman with this shadow, this resemblance and image of God. And not only is he created in the image of God, he is created in the likeness. And that means an external pattern. And so as human beings, we are distinctively created out of all that God has made as the only piece of creation that, listen to me, okay, is created in the image of God, as an external pattern of God, and in the shadow of God. That is distinctively human. Now, let me say some things to help you understand what this uh, in, in greater fashion means. The image of God resides in human beings, regardless of their salvific status. As we look at this passage, what we see is that this image of God is, uh, is put into humanity at creation. Now, we're going to see in a few chapters that humanity falls from God and disobeys God and sin enters the world. And when that happened, humans don't lose the image of God in their life. They still retain that image of God. Now, in some capacities, that might be affected or tainted or diminished. However, we don't lose that image even though we have fallen into sin and are now uh, sinful human beings. It is a continuing quality or capacity even after the fall. It resides within humans, uh, in our human nature, even after the fall. And what we need to understand is that Jesus is the best reflection of this image for human understanding. If you want to know what it means to bear the image of God as a human being, we need to look at the person of Jesus. Jesus is the best reflection. Jesus is the best um, image of God that we can possibly see in human form. This image of God is best understood through one's relationship with God. And this image produces some functional components such as rule and dominion. If you go back to this passage, what you need to see is that immediately after God creates man in his image and in his likeness, it says that he tells him to go rule over the rest of creation. So this image of God carries with it a component that is functional. That there is something that, that, that we should do because we are created in the image of God. And a part of that function is that representative rule and dominion that God desires for us to um, demonstrate because we are created in the image of God. Thus, the likeness and image of God should lead to the fulfillment of God's divine purpose for humanity. Because we alone are distinctively created in the image of God, there is purpose to human life that other parts of creation uh, don't have. Now this is significant, so don't miss this. If you subscribe to the fact that humans are nothing more than an evolutionary change from, um, from, let's say, something from the jungle, which was an evolutionary change from something that crawled, which was an evolutionary change from something that creeped or swam in the ocean or from something that was a singular cell organism, if you subscribe to that mentality, listen to me, humanity has no purpose at all. When you hold to that mentality, you lose divine purpose in your life because you're nothing more than a chain in a link or you're nothing more than a link in a chain. And so today, when we begin to dig into what it really means to be human, it is absolutely significant to understand that humanity has a distinct and divine creation. And as a part of that, um, that design, we are to rule over creation. Humanity is the pinnacle of creation, and with that 
um, status comes special design and mandate. And that mandate is for both male and female. You see, uh, when we look at this passage, he goes on in verse 27 to say, God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So in other words, God created this special helper that no other uh, could match. There is no other kind on earth that could match uh, the beautiful match that man and woman have together. So what is said about humanity must be of both male and female, and that the truest picture of what it means to be human is to be found in the context of man and woman together. It's incredible. If you really want to know what it means to be human, the truest context of that is not man by himself. It's not woman by herself. It's man and woman together. That's blessed. And they are given the command to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth and subdue it. In other words, that as the image of God, wherever we go on planet earth, hum- humanity takes the presence of God. And they cast the shadow of God wherever their feet tread. So as we um, fulfill that mandate to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth and to subdue it, we subdue it by taking the presence of God wherever we go. That's what we're talking about, to be human. Now, let's dig into Genesis chapter 2 because when we look at Genesis chapter 2, we go on to discover about humanity that humanity has a distinct and divine purpose. Follow along with me. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. It says, Then the... Uh, It says, then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Skip down to verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely eat die. See, now what we see is that humanity has a distinct and divine purpose. The breath of God has been breathed into uh, to Adam, to humanity. And then Adam is given this, this mandate, this purpose by God to cultivate and keep the garden. You need to remember those two words, to cultivate and to keep the garden. The word cultivate means to work or to serve. By implication, it is to serve another person, to work for another person. So what God is saying, when God created mankind and he said, go work, he said, go work for me, go serve me in the garden. You are to do what you do for me. In Exodus chapter 20, this word is used in reference to working or serving another God. It's translated with the word worship. Do not worship another God. Do not work or serve another God. So when we understand what God's really saying here, when he says cultivate um, the garden and cultivate the earth, he is saying, worship me in everything that you do, okay? Work and serve me. To serve me out of devotion, that's worship. And so here, as we are seeing the, the distinct purpose of humanity unfold, it begins with worship of God, working and serving God out of devotion as an act of worship. It also is about keeping, keeping guard, keeping observance, taking heed, guarding and protecting the garden. What we see in verses 16 and 17 is a command. Look at verse 16. The Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden, you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat it. For in the day in which you eat from it, you will surely die. Man is commanded now to obey. It is the command of God to obey his word, to guard the garden, and to keep your lives um, in conformance with the commands and teachings of God. One commentator says this, and I like this. He says, theology doesn't just ask how human beings came uh, came into being, but why. What purpose lies behind their presence here? See, if we try and understand humanity, but we don't try and do it from a theological perspective, we lose that. We lose the why that we exist. What happens is that we're trying to find the how we were created apart from the why we were created. And when we do that, we lose 
our distinctively human being status. See, the biblical picture of humanity's origin is that an all-wise, all-powerful, all-good God created the human race to love and serve Him and to enjoy a relationship with Him. That's why we're created. That is the divine purpose. That is that distinctly uh, divine and human purpose. An all-wise God, all-powerful, all-good, created us to love, serve, and enjoy a relationship with Him. But then in Genesis chapter 3, we discover that humanity has a distinct and divine problem. Look at Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden... God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day in which you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. She gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves loin coverings. See, this chapter now begins to reveal to us how humanity has a distinct problem. A distinct problem. The Bible calls that problem sin. Sin is disobedience and a failure to worship God. As we dig into Genesis chapter 3, we see Satan's lie. Satan's lie is to question God. Has God said that? Has God really said what you think he has said? And Satan's lie to question God, all right, is an attempt to get us to doubt God's word, to doubt the truthfulness of it, the power of it, to guide and give us life as human beings. And when we give in to that lie, all right, that's sin. Sin. We also see in this passage Satan's deception. He says to her, you surely will not die. He's deceiving her into thinking that somehow she will not face the consequences of this decision, that she won't face death. See, Satan deceives us into thinking that there are other places and other things that can give life And he seeks to distract us and deceive us all by what this world has. And he seeks to deceive you and I from understanding that the wages of sin is death. And he seeks to draw us away from God and the worship and obedience of him. He's lying to us and he's deceiving us. And from the very first moment that we breathe our very first breath on this planet, we are not only in sin, but he is coming after us to deceive us and lie to us and keep us in sin. This passage shows three different ploys that Satan uses against us as human beings to get us to to sin against God. The first is regarding what's edible. What's edible. See, Satan seeks to distract you with your hungers. So let me just ask us all for just a moment. What do you hunger for? What do you hunger for? And however you answer that question, you need to be on guard. You need to beware. Beware of that because Satan may just use that thing that you hunger for to lead you to sin. But not only that, he uses the ploy of what's pleasurable. Satan seeks to distract you and I with pleasures. So let me ask you, what what do you seek pleasure from most? When you have a moment to enjoy and when you seek to make yourself happy, what, what, what do you seek to get pleasure from? Because Satan can use those pleasures to cloud your vision and cloud your trust in him. But not only that, the third ploy of Satan is that which is desirable. Satan seeks to distract you with our desires. He will twist our hopes and our dreams and he will use them to turn us away from from God and our love and devotion to him. And these ploys, they've not changed. 
These are the same ploys that he has used throughout history to lie to us and deceive us and turn us to sin and away from obedience and worship of God. Sin is the distinct humanly uh, problem. Sin is also the attempt to cover yourself. I think this is extremely important for you to see. You see, after Adam and Eve partake of the fruit, they have sinned against God, and the very first thing that they try and do is cover it up. The eyes of both of them were opened. They knew that they were naked, and so they tried to cover themselves up. Sin is not just disobedience and a failure to worship. Sin is the attempt to cover yourself on your own. Since the sin in the garden, humanity has been seeking to cover themselves up. Humanity is finite and limited, and this limitation prevents humanity from saving themselves. You and I cannot cover up our sin. We cannot fix our sin problem. We can't um, atone for it. We can't um, remove it. Because we are created beings, we are limited. And the fact that humans are created means that we have no independent existence. And this should cause us to ask the reason for our existence. Why are we here? Why were we created? What was the plan? What was the purpose? And if we have this problem of sin, how do we fix it? How can we overcome it in our lives? Humanity required a divine intervention to overcome their sin problem. And that divine intervention, listen to me, required a death to be paid for the sins of humanity. And that debt required a person with no debt of their own. Therefore, a perfect sinless person was needed and would have to willingly give their life as a substitute for the sinful humanity to ransom them from the debt of the sin that was owed. And God sent his one and only son, his perfect sinless son, to pay that debt. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came. And Jesus pays the price of a sin debt that all of humanity owed. And so that problem required a divine and distinct answer. Sin. The result of the first man's actions. Listen to what one commentator says. Sin, guilt, and death are universal facts of human existence. They are essential parts of Paul's doctrine of humanity. Paul explains that all humans die because sin came into the world through one person. And death is a manifestation of the condemnation resulting from one human's sin. What you and I experience today... We experience uniquely as human beings because of the sin that occurred all the way back in Genesis. So, how do we think about this today? How does this impact our lives today as human beings? Well, number one, let me give you this thought. Our study of humanity will help us understand ourselves. Our study of humanity will help us understand ourselves. Why are we doing this? Brian, Brian, why are you sharing this this morning? I'm sharing this this morning because, listen, you and I need to study humanity because when we do, it will help us understand who we are. There is a loss of historical data and accurate history, and that's creating a problem for self-understanding. Everything is trying to be changed. All of history and the truth of what's happened in the past, it's trying to be erased and and removed and changed and replaced. And as that loss of an accurate historical um, history occurs, it's going to make it more and more um, difficult for us to understand where we came from, how we were created, and why we're here. And we see that in schools, in universities, all over the United States and all over the world. Because of that, we're losing sight of not only why we're here, but what opportunities have been established for us to fix the problem that we face as humans. Number two, our perception of what human beings are understood to be will color our perception of what is needed to be done for them. Let me say that again. Our perception of what humans are understood to be will color our perception of what needs to be done for them. 
if you think that, if you think that human beings are nothing more than, um, than a link in a chain, that human beings have, have done nothing but evolve from and change from previous kinds of animals and organisms, then listen, that's going to color what you think needs to be done because if that's what you think, there's nothing that needs to be done. There's no sin problem. There's no purpose. There's no direction for our lives. So there's nothing to be done. And it means human life is pointless. And so based on your perception of what human beings are understood to be, nothing more than a link in a chain, then that means, listen, there is no hope for you. There's no purpose for you being here. But when we understand that human beings are created in the image of God, when we understand that God has given us a divine purpose, now we can begin to address the problem that we all face with sin by understanding that God wants to reconcile us back to that divine purpose and to that divine um, holy state that we were in prior to sin entering this world. Number three, our understanding of human beings will affect how we minister to them. Our understanding of human beings will affect how we minister to, uh, to them. All right, listen, if you and I think that human beings are primarily physical and we're, we're just, we're, we're what we are in this body, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna f- shape the church's ministry, right? Um, to feed the body, to clothe the body, to medicate the body, to take care of the body so that the body is okay. And so all of a sudden, all of our ministries will look like ministries that make the body better. Okay? If we think, no, 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 the, the main purpose of human beings being here is that, you know what, they're supposed to work, they're supposed to have jobs, they're, they're supposed to be doing stuff, and so it's about them kind of like being like machines that, that put in eight hours of something every day, they produce something. If that's how we think human beings are, then listen, what we're going to strive for is equality from everybody. Everybody's working a little bit, everybody's doing a little bit, although the production's the same, and what we're looking for is that similarity and equality of life. God's glory is the highest value in the cosmos. Not human pleasure, not human comfort. So when we understand that human beings exist by the creative act of God for God's glory as the highest value in the cosmos, now we will begin to shape our ministries to bring about the glory of God. Amen? And finally, number four, because we are made in God's image, we are a picture of God's existence and attributes. If somebody were to ask you, how do you know there's a God? Just tell them, look at yourself. Look at yourself. You're created in the image of God. You are a walking shadow of God's presence on earth. Every one of us, man or woman, boy or girl, as human beings, we are created in the image of God and we bear that image and we are a shadow and a symbol of God's existence and attributes. And we need to take that with us because if we lose sight of that, we lose our purpose, we lose our meaning, and we have no answer for the problems we face as human beings. Amen.